Hi, good morning all. Hi, good morning. Thank you for joining for today's LinkedIn Live. Good morning, Sumi ma'am. Good How morning. How are you today? Doing great. Yeah. Hi, I'm Arva Bombaywala and we have your Dr. Nivedita Srivastava and Professor Sumi Jha with us. We'll deep dive into people analytics. I'm sure our audience would be waiting uh, for Sumi ma'am to share her insights on people analytics. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce our guest today, uh, Dr. Nevedita, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Irva. I hope everyone's having a lovely morning. I am Dr. Nevedita Shrivastava, and I'm the founder and CEO of Nine Links. And uh, as an organization, Nine Links basically carries expertise in the space of psychometric assessments and organization development. Thank you. So, Vivam, can you... Uh, uh, explain our audience what you do and introduce yourself uh thank you arva and um i am professor sumi Jha. Uh, i am professor for organizational behavior and human resource management uh, and i also take subjects like people analytics um, as a professor we have uh, not only as a teaching we are involved we are also involved in training consulting and research activities um, and uh, you all would have understood by now people analytics is actually very close to my heart and i understand that uh, if we will measure um, people related data we can take a lot of strategic decisions in the organization okay Great, I'll uh, ask you two to have the conversation and we'll take the questions at the end of the session. So uh, you can address to Dr. Nivedita or Sumi ma'am your questions you have at the end of the session. Okay. Thank you. Let's begin, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so Sumi, it's always so uh, nice to have you around as and uh, also as an advisor to nine links as a research advisor to nine links so it's always such a pleasure to have you around and supporting us in our endeavors of uh, you know promoting not only psychometric assessments but people analytics and organization development as a you know key vision that nine links carries uh, besides other activities this is a new series of event that we have started under the banner of nine links which is a conversation with an expert in specific areas. So this uh, this conversation, that's this LinkedIn Live that we're doing with you, will be the second is the second one that we're doing. And of course, we would love to have you again, once again, for several other areas as well. So uh, yes, so I think I hope uh, uh, you're all geared up for this uh, engaging and lovely experience. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nivedita, for uh, inviting me for this, for sharing my views on my favorite topic. Uh, but I'll uh, let you let it be free flow and ask a few questions and I'll uh, I'm uh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I think uh, just to begin with the basics, uh, my first question would be a very basic one, I'm sure. And uh, uh, I think uh, just to introduce the topic of people analytics, I would want to ask you that what do we actually mean by the term people analytics? Although there's been a lot of buzz around this world, around this term, around this word, but yes, it would be really nice if you could, you know, share more insights as to what do we actually mean by people analytics. Um, okay, so uh, people analytics is a function where we collect understand and analyze people related or employee related information fine so we collect information in the form of data and we try to provide a meaningful insight for strategic decisions so we collect information convert them into data and use it for decision making there are some pillars of people analytics we start with uh, workforce planning analytics talent sourcing and acquisition analytics, onboarding and engagement analytics, performance management analytics, then attrition and retention analytics. And recently, uh, uh, we have also added employee wellness analytics uh, in the fold of people analytics. So uh, it, is, uh, it is a vast area where wherever we can collect people related data and make sense out of that data would fall under uh, people analytics area. Sure, sure, right. 
So as I understand that uh, people analytics has multi-fold advantages. And uh, I think wherever uh, there are numbers associated with any uh, information that we gather, that kind of definitely takes care, uh, takes care of the objectivity and the scientific nature that we bring to the table, I think. So I, uh, I'm sure uh, this must be quite an engaging uh, area. So going forward, would also want to understand that when you have really explained that where all, which all domains of HR or you know, human resources for that matter, people analytics is essential. I'm sure you'd want to, uh, you know, uh, throw more light in with the detailed, uh, you know, uh, information when we proceed further with the conversation. But uh, I think it's also important to understand besides the what, uh, the second question that, of course, pops up into anybody's uh, on anybody's mind is the why, why factor, right? So uh, the second question that I want to ask is that why do we really need people analytics, and also how uh, you know does it really actually work? Does people analytics actually really work, and you know what could be possible advantages of it? So maybe you could throw more insights into that. Um. Uh, I'll just start with uh, one statement wherein uh, when you said that uh, people analytics would be more about collecting data in numbers. So actually, it is beyond that. It is not only so data that we collect is not necessarily in numbers. It can be uh, qualitative data, which is interviews and all which uh, uh, on which I may speak a little later. But uh, let me answer your question of why people analytics, which is uh, definitely uh, a very pressing uh, need. The, the answer to this question is very important because sometimes we still have doubts that shell organization uh, should go for people analytics uh, uh, as a uh, function or not. So uh, actually people analytics helps in taking meaningful people related strategic decisions. Uh, so sometimes we take decision that may not add much meaning to the, uh, uh, to the decision. So meaningful uh, people related strategic decision. Before the trend of people analytics, uh, we would have information then also but we never took effort in creating a platform for organizing employee data in a structured form. So people analytics actually helped in organizing uh, people related data in structured form and then take informed decisions based on the data that we have. So therefore, uh, here, this was one of the benefit that we had of uh, people analytics. Secondly, uh, data-based uh, people-related decisions actually helped in minimizing biases, being aware of latent and hidden information, and then taking objective decisions. So what uh, would happen is sometimes in our decisions, a lot of um, biases would creep in. If we have objective data with us and we are taking informed decision, the chances are there that we will minimize uh, minimize biases. Uh, and therefore, uh, this was of uh, importance. Uh, so the first or second reason that I was saying for why people analytics is it helps HR department to start organizing employee data in a meaningful way, which in turn helps for effective recruitment, engagement, talent, retention related decisions that organization takes. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Right, of course. Right. <clears throat> so uh, going forward to me, uh, while uh, we know there are multiple functions or under, you know, under the whole umbrella of uh, uh, human resource management, right? Uh, but I think the basics start with uh, talent acquisition. So whichever sector of organization, whatever size of organization that we, you know, that we talk about, uh, I think talent acquisition is one wing of human resource management, which is, which apparently is one of the most imperative ones. You can't do away with talent acquisition, you know. So let's just say that there might be a small organization which might not be very, uh, you know, invested into the learning and development of uh, their employees, let's say a micro or a small scale organization. But uh, apparently, they just can't do away with the uh, talent acquisition. Of course, uh, the rate at which they might be engaging into that process would enti entirely depend on, you know, what are their 
size of the organization and several other parameters right so uh, yes so i think uh, as i just you know uh, spoke about that talent acquisition being one of the most important wings of human resource management one of the most imperative ones as well so uh, if you could also share that what could be the op- applications of people analytics as you know as a um, as an area or as a stream right that how could it be used for people and uh, sorry for talent acquisition under what various organizations and also how beneficial it could be in the long run okay uh, so of course as i said uh, people analytics it has several pillars and one of the pillar wherein people analytics is used extensively is at the stage of talent acquisition and uh, i'll also share one small ppt uh, to explain the, um, the this particular phenomena but uh, let me just start with uh, we know the phrase that we have what gets measured gets done so um, earlier when we used to have our recruitment or talent acquisition function we would say that uh, we could not get uh, a particular kind of talent or we would have excuses um, but now talent acquisition analytics helped us in measuring these concepts so effectively that we will be able to achieve our targets better so um, uh, so as i was saying so it is one of the important function of hr department uh, as talent acquisition and in simple word when we say we can say recruitment system being effective or ineffective so whether my recruitment system is effective uh then we can say that my talent acquisition is effective or not effective and we can also say that whether we are acquiring right candidate or not uh, so let me just share some basic metrics that organization can use to check um how the talent acquisition function performs uh given these metrics and if they are able to perform well in these metrics uh it will definitely result in significant cost reduction for the organization in the long run uh, which you were asking so let me just share um, one ppt with you all to explain this phenomena in a uh, much uh, better way Okay, so I think uh, they are not letting me uh, upload it. So maybe I'll again try. So Arva, I have already shared uh, the slides with you um, yesterday. So will it be possible to uh, upload it? uh but in in general i'll just tell you by the time that there are several ways through which we can actually do talent acquisition metrics so for example uh, actually the audience can answer uh, a few questions wherein how we will measure the vacancy rate is it that organizations are able to uh, measure vacancy rate or not fine so is it that i am letting my vacant position being vacant for longer period of time or am i able to fill it quickly fine uh, second uh, could be uh, like uh, first year turnover rate uh, wherein we try to understand that how uh, quickly we can uh, or is it that my when when i recruit a candidate um, how quickly they are leaving the organization um, are we able to retain them at least for one year or is it that within one year they left so uh, we will have a matrix wherein we can say that uh, how many candidates were recruited this year and how many of them left within a year so if 
candidates are leaving within a year, this means there is some problem in our um, acquisition or talent acquisition process itself. Another parameter through which we can understand and measure the talent acquisition is, uh, I think uh, Arva is uh, asking a question. Yes, uh, Arva, you can upload it. So um, another, so next slide, Arva. And further. Yeah, so this is the slide that I wanted to refer, wherein, uh, you know, vacancy rate is one measure through which we can understand talent acquisition effectiveness. And the second uh, method through which we can understand talent uh, uh, acquisition effectiveness is by measuring how quickly employees leave organization. Is it that they stay in the organization for at least three, four years or within a year they leave the organization? A third important parameter through which we can measure talent acquisition is, um, is the new hire performance. Uh, and we can check whether within a year before the probation period happens, how good the performance is. If the performance is not so good, we have the option for taking a decision on the, um, on the candidate. So it is important for us to measure that and see if in the first year, the performance of candidates are good. This means my talent acquisition process that I have followed are good. So can we measure that? Can we identify how many of candidates did we uh, uh, onboarded this year and then how they performed in the first year? So, uh, and if it is beyond our average performance expectation, then we can say that our uh, acquisition process was good. And one more point which is uh, important in this case is time to fill. Time to fill the vacancy or vacant position is another measure through which we can say that our talent acquisition process is effective. So if we are taking long time to fill, it is not so effective. If we are taking too short a time to fill, then also it may not be effective because I may compromise on the quality of the candidate. So therefore, uh, here we try to fill the position in an optimum time. And then we understand that uh, what is the time lag between the process of acquisition started and the candidate has accepted the offer. It should be optimum time. It should not be too less that I'm compromising on the quality of candidate and it should not be too much that uh, the need for that candidate itself won't happen. Fine. So this is one uh, point wherein these are four quick metrics through which we can understand how effective my talent acquisition process is. Yeah, over to you. Okay, sure. So I think uh, this was definitely very helpful for me, wherein, you know, many times our recruiter friends uh, face several challenges in filling up, uh, you know, various positions, some which are like hot burning uh, positions, you know, that they always struggle with. So I think such kind of people analytics uh, and information that they can gather during the process, you know, right from the beginning can help them in the long run. So, uh, yes, I think uh, this is definitely one piece of... Uh, value added information for our friends from the rec recruitment fraternity so yes definitely i think one other issue that our friends in the recruitment industry people in the talent acquisition domain they face is uh, the dropout of candidates right uh, i'm sure it's uh, uh, it's like an ouch factor for all our uh, friends wherein uh, you know uh, with all the struggle and and all the effort that they've done and at the last moment the candidate has simply dropped out <laughs> and i'm sure it's one uh, chaotic uh, morning uh, for everybody that you know that this candidate was just about to join and uh, we don't get to hear we can't hear back from him right so how do you think that uh, you know talent acquisition or analytics can predict uh, about potential renich of the candidate so i'm sure uh, with your uh, you know help such kind of situations such kind of 
bad mornings could definitely be avoided for any you know any any expert in the domain of talent acquisition could be quite a uh, relief i would rather say so yes please uh, it, it would be nice to hear from you on that yeah so i'll take this piece from the last point which is mentioned in talent acquisition effectiveness which is time to fill so if you see here uh, it is written a uh, uh, new hire accepts an offer of employment but ideally this time to fill should be measured as until a new hire joins an em employment because after acceptance also many employees leave or many candidates leave or they won't join fine so therefore the effectiveness is measured primarily uh, by a new hire joining the organization rather than new hire just accepting an offer of employment now uh, so there is an uh, organization um, at uh, bangalore scale in works uh, maybe someone would uh, know about it so they do a very good work on um, on predicting renage and uh, so there are some factors that they try and collect beforehand the information about candidate they try and collect beforehand uh, so the information like apart from the information that we usually collect which is uh, of course about gender name name of the organization and other points apart from that what um, what they definitely collect is what is the date of joining that the candidate wants okay and then they also collect over a period of time after acceptance of offer that how many times the candidate has extended the date of joining is it that the candidate has extended the date of joining so if candidate is extending date of joining two three times this is one of indica the indication that the candidate may renege one number two what is the notice period so if the candidate is giving a notice period is okay but is it that the candidate is extending the notice period what is the duration of extension if the candidate is on zero day notice period chances of renege is less if the candidate is 3 months notice period the chances of renege is high fine fine similarly um, at which level they are joining so if it is at the senior level middle level or junior level uh, this information helps fourth information which is very helpful is the salary differential that they are expecting and we are providing fine so they would have certain compensation at the previous organization and then certain compensation differential would be offered in the new organization how much is that is that significantly different or is it that that was what was expected by the candidate who is joining so if the, there is an agreement in the salary differential the chances of renege is less so after providing an offer uh, there is something called pofu post offer follow up the post offer follow up by employers uh, starts and in that post offer follow up they check whether the date of joining was extended or not whether the notice period was extended or not whether the candidate is male or a female whether the salary differential was satisfactory or not whether the um, whether the level was middle level or junior level uh, whether there was a transfer proposed or uh, the home location is not the location the location of employment is somewhere else so now when we have a profile of a candidate which says that the candidate has extended offer letter uh, date of joining the candidate has extended notice period the candidate is male from middle level and so on then there are 80% to 90% of chances are there that we will be able to predict renege we can say if the profile of a candidate matches these criteria chances are there that the candidate would renege and by reducing or by being able to predict at least 80% of time 
uh, it saves lots of cost to the uh, for the organization. So this is uh, one way wherein Greenwich can be uh, reduced significantly. That's a very interesting example. In fact, you know, just the way uh, people analytics is such so close to you or to your heart. Uh, I think similarly, uh, you know, I can just kind of uh, remember one case study, you know, case that I came across, of course, uh, just the way, uh, as I was just mentioning that people analytics is close to your heart. Psychometrics is something that I breathe day in and day out. <laughs> so, but then interestingly, I could just recollect something that, you know, why we were just explaining that example of, uh, you know, uh, somebody who's uh, extended notice periods, yeah. so would be, yeah. uh, would have a higher tendency to drop out and experience more. So something that I just thought, you know, maybe I should share with you as well, that mm -hmm. uh, once we were doing, uh, uh, you know, uh, we were conducting psychometric assessments for the lower rung roles for a, uh, you know, for a microfinance company. And interestingly, the integrity score that we had assessed of a candidate was very low, uh, you know, was actually in the non-acceptable range. And uh, when the recruiter at the client end, you know, they kind of correlated it with the Sybil score, it turned out to be so that his low integrity score also correlated to his low Sybil score. So that's how I think information, deeper insights into a person's profile could help us, uh, you know, could save us as well from various uh, mishaps during the recruitment process and just one more that i thought i could share mm -hmm. was that uh, uh, again uh, you know a similar exercise that we did for the same organization so apparently a female candidate uh, stress mm -hmm. tolerance levels and adaptability were very less so uh, when it turned out to be so when they dug deep into her you know into her family backgrounds etc they realized that she was a single mom struggling with a you know with a bedridden uh, mother so it kind of you know kind of helped us uh, become more confident that uh, yes uh, such kind of insights definitely help a recruiter so i'm sure uh, just something that i just remembered and i thought i could share with you as well uh, great thank you so much these yeah. were very yeah. interesting yeah. okay sure. thanks okay. uh going forward to me uh so while um, we spoke about the potential lineage of the candidate, right? It would be also very nice to understand that how can, you know, people analytics help us identify uh, the better of the lot, the creamier lot and more talented employees. And uh, also, uh, can it help us in understanding or predicting that what are the chances or, you know, what are the, uh, what is the rate at which maybe they would probably leave sooner? So is there something which could help us, in, uh, you know, gauge that as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, usually organization uses performance management system uh, for identifying the high performer and low performer employees. Uh, but the question is, shall we say that employee who is high performer will be the most talented one? Because uh, when we try and understand talent, uh, it is possible that they may not be um, they may not be high performer. They may be contributing to the team through some of the talent. So uh, it, that is one important point that we need to identify. So here, people analytics comes very handy. Uh, for the organization, actually team performance and organizational performance is more important than individual performance. Um, so if we will nurture talent by collecting data beyond performance, we will be able to understand contributions and efforts of employees towards team and that shall be recognized. So when, when we talked about, uh, and therefore, you know, we misinterpret high performer versus high talent employees. And it is possible that high performer leaves the organization, another high performer may join the organization. But if high talent employee leave the organization, it leaves a void in the organization. Fine. So therefore, it is important for us to uh, recognize them. So these days, uh, many employees are leaving organization, for example, because of lack of flexibility of work, uh, work from home um, uh, and work from office phenomena. So you, we all know that uh, organizations have uh, started uh, 
you know calling uh, employees and they are not able to retain their uh, employees in the organization because of the lack of flexibility um, so there is a small um, analytics that uh, that an organization can do and they can it can help in reducing attrition significantly uh, so can i request uh, you to just go to the next slide arva yeah so this is uh, one important point so here what uh, organization had done simply is to uh, understand the uh, the matrix of flexibility or hybrid work in two points which is one is place and another is time so and then ask employees where you fit in terms of flexibility so rather than just giving flexibility of time of coming from this to this it is important for us to understand that different employee has different need and thus flexibility the definition of flexibility itself may differ and because of which many talented employee may leave the organization so this particular matrix actually helps us in understanding what is the place that they is it a place a constraint for an employee so if it is not a constraint then the employee can come to the office and can work but if it is a constraint then let them work from anywhere another could be time is it that time is a constraint for me or i am i will be able to work any time in a week or in a, any time in a day so i for example i would say that i would like to work between uh, 8:30 am to 6:30 pm and that is what is my preferred time i do not have any constraint of place i can work from home or i can work from office fine so as an employee i am giving this situation to the organization some other employee may say that my flexibility uh, i do not need flexibility of time time any time would work for me day night it's okay but i want to work from home place is a constraint for me fine or some of them is unconstrained about both the things so they are okay to work from office at night or at day time or at from home from at night or at day time so they do not have any constraint no constraint of place no constraint of time so if organization can just think a little and divide their employees in these four quadrants the attrition that is happening or the talent attrition that is happening because of lack of flexibility can be reduced significantly and this simple matrix will give lot of information about the employee and can provide uh, and can help organization a lot in reducing and organizing uh, task a lot i hope uh, this is what uh, you meant uh, yes Nivedita. absolutely absolutely i think uh, uh, what i also gather that this process has to be pretty pre planned uh it cannot be a a, a post process uh, you know exercise so of course uh, it has to be you know a, a fairly pre planned wherein as a system as a process in the organization and only then i think uh, please correct me if i'm wrong that only then uh, an organization can reap fruits of such kind of people analytics in the long run so it cannot be so that uh, this is run just for a few positions for a few uh, you know high potential uh, positions or a few you know uh, i would rather say um, hot positions and only use it for that and uh, i think it has to be fairly pre planned a very uh, uh, you know uh, time investing process as well yes yes so uh, if sure. so uh, probably um, before at uh, so every time we have one year uh, plan whenever we may make that plan an organization can take an informed decision would they like to classify their employees into these four quadrants or not if it is suited for them then they can do and when they are doing this classification it is not that they will do only for the uh, knowledge uh, management or knowledge Uh, driven people it would be for for traditional employees as well or for uh, maybe contract employee as well so for all kind of employees and at all level if if they are willing to they they buy in this 
particular classification then only it is possible as you rightly right. said yes absolutely yes uh, now that we have spoken about, you know, one of the most important uh, rings of human resource management, I think something is that, uh, you know, organizations deal maybe on it. I mean, while the process happens yearly or maybe biannually for some organizations, but I'm sure uh, the activity runs uh, throughout the year, which is of, uh, and, uh, of performance appraisal which uh, you know all employees look forward to and uh, i'm sure it's uh, quite a you know uh, tedious process that uh, hr professionals take up right in an organization again irrespective of what size and sector we are talking about so uh, going back to that you know so performance appraisal is also something that which is uh, which could help organizations actually um, improve the performance of individuals and also make them more satisfied as i said right so how do you think that uh, and also how to how can people analytics help in identifying data noise from performance appraisal um and we all know that um, performance appraisal is most sought after uh, activity uh, for everyone but I think I would say it is most neglected also, uh, given the uh, kind of situation uh, that we have. Uh, and we assume that there is no noise in the data. Uh, or in other words, there is no biases in the appraisal data. And data is objectively collected. That is what the assumption is. Uh, and therefore, we will be able to differentiate good performers versus bad performers. So if you see the um, if you see the slide, it says there are two different normal distributions that are made, or two different group of people that are there. One who are who have put in very low effort, and another who have put in very high effort. And it just says that uh, we assume that uh, when when we collect data, we will get data in something like this. Uh, the previous slide, please. Um, Arva. Uh, so we assume that we will get data in this fashion, wherein the distribution is very significantly different for low effort people and for high effort people. But when actually uh, we go for uh, analysis or but in reality, what we get is something which is very different, difficult to differentiate. So the next slide, uh, which is there, which shows that uh, the data is overlapping. So usually we get something like this, wherein low effort people ra rating and high effort people rating almost are similar. So we get data something like this. We would like to get data like that in the as in the previous slide. But when performance appraisal happens, the data that we receive is mostly like this, wherein we are not able to differentiate good performer versus bad performer or high effort people versus low effort people. And this is primarily because of presence of noise in the data. And when I say noise, uh, I mean um uh, i mean the biases that are there in the data the uh, sometimes we have uh, appraisers who won't be able to take ownership of the whole um, you know whole um, performance appraisal uh, parameter and uh, then there would uh, there would be presence of a lot of biases and non objective way of collection of data may happen and because of all these, the uh, there would be errors in the data. And these error biases, non-objective way of collection of data, all these causes data to be not the perfect data. And it gives me a little imperfect data. And because of the imperfection in the data, uh, the, the imperfection in the data is what noise in the data is. So if we have right data, objective data, bias-free data, then we have lesser noise in the data. And we can actually uh, try to minimize that significantly. And this is uh, one very interesting uh, 
picture that we can get anywhere actually and just let me just share how noise in the data can lead to uh, you know uh, a situation wherein we will overfit uh, the uh, you know performance of an employee so here what is happening is if you see the dotted lines are actually data for me and how i am interpreting that data so sometimes it becomes very difficult to interpret data and based on experience i can make some kind of meaning to the data but sometimes some of us go so enthusiastic or maybe because of biases or maybe uh, trying to relate unrelated things and then trying to give a story to the data whenever we do this we end up making data uh, we overfit data and we try to uh, justify data whatever we have and all these processes are because of lot of error that is there in the data error of course in terms of biases as i said one number two objective way of collection of data and third error that we have is interpretation of it itself so when we are interpreting it we may overfit and give a uh, wrong kind of understanding to the whole performance appraisal phenomena so uh, it is therefore important to minimize the um, minimize the noise in the data by objectively collecting data by minimizing biases and by not overfitting our assumptions uh, is that okay or uh, no, too many jargon did i use <laughs> no i i think uh, uh, the topic in itself is so vast that uh, you know having an uh, you know understand understanding the whole topic in about a span of 40 minutes or 45 minutes i'm sure this needs much more detail of course but uh, yes prima facie i think to begin with uh, this primary information is definitely very helpful so that's um, yes i'm sure uh, we would love to you know engage with you more on to understanding how this could be used for performance appraisal as well uh, great sure okay uh going back to you know the initial discussion that we were just having so we were you just mentioned that uh, uh that you know just numbers are not something which is a part of people analytics it is beyond numbers right so i completely agree and understand that that uh, people analytics necessarily doesn't have to be quantitative but uh, a very important part of it is qualitative analysis as well so yes if you could also kind of share as to you know uh, maybe maybe if you could just start with a little on the basics right as to how do you differentiate between qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis maybe just to bring in a you know a base for the discussion and then as, of course if you could just deep dive into what is the importance of both qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis sure um so um, arva actually you can just skip two more slides and there is a slide on qualitative and quantitative so it would be helpful for the uh, uh, for the audience uh, but what i believe uh, nivedita is uh, it is we cannot actually uh, neglect human in human resource management so it is very important for us to understand there is human in human resource management so we cannot only deal with data uh, we are dealing with human data or we are dealing with people data and there it is very therefore it becomes sometimes difficult to um, to quantify everything and uh, just make sense out of quantified data so i always emphasize on whenever we are collecting data it is important to listen to the narrative of the user department fine so if i am my user department i am collecting data on sales employees it is important for us to go to the marketing and sales department listen to the narrative of the um, managers of that department make note of those narratives because all those narratives are data for me fine uh, just collecting number number or numerical data may not be helpful why i am saying this is because sometimes numerical data may give me an indication of let us say it says manager or managerial positions of sales um, professionals 
they need training on certain skill set and when i heard the narrative of uh, user department that was corroborated so then it gives me much more um, authentic point to make to the top management that my data as well as narrative of user department both said that the uh, training on certain such and such aspects are required therefore qualitative as well as quantitative data both are important for us uh, so qualitative data here uh, as you can see in the slide is more about having statements or um, in 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 answering a question which is why or observations symbols uh, or in terms of written statements that are there so whenever we take interview of someone we will get narrative and those narrative statements are qualitative data for us qualitative data are also sometimes collected in terms of expressions so it is important for me to understand that if someone is giving me very positive answer in quantitative form what kind of facial expression that person had at the time of giving that very positive response was it in line with each other was it in sync with each other so whoever is collecting data must understand it is important for us to marry qualitative and quantitative data before taking any decision so if you see qualitative data are about uh, something which is non numeric something which has written information somewhere we can observe and identify and make note of it on the other hand qualitative uh, quantitative data are in numeric form wherein we have numbers and the beauty of number on the other hand is that it gets interpreted similarly on the qualitative data interpretation may differ differently by different individual but quantitative data gets interpreted in a in same manner or it has similar meaning for multiple people so that is one thing because of which quantitative data is more powerful and therefore we have numbers here we can measure things we can do statistical analysis here and uh, therefore um, and i would say quantitative data relatively easier to manage in comparison to qualitative data okay. uh, and uh, we can go actually lot of deep uh, understanding we can get more insight through qualitative data support it through quantitative data and then take it further uh, so that is what is uh, my understanding on qualitative versus quantitative data in people analytics balance sure. i think uh, you know these as i just uh, told you some time back as well that i really feel that uh, this whole area of people analytics definitely needs uh, much more time in terms of investment so uh, we would definitely want to connect with our viewers later through email or through messages and try and understand if they would want to engage into a, you know a, a workshop for a longer duration and try and understand from you as well as to how we could kind of collaborate uh, for the benefit of the larger group right so yes i think uh, so me this was a very uh, you know insightful discussion that i personally think i had with you right and i'm sure our viewers would carry the same opinion so uh, you being the expert on people analytics and i really don't know anybody else right now other than you <laughs> so i really engage and understand uh, your you know the way you uh, make things simpler as well so uh, it was a pleasure having you with us and i would now want uh, arva to maybe uh, have you know take up questions for uh, sumi and uh, we could surely maybe address most of the questions if not all yeah right so we have a couple of questions here i'll take the first question from deep datta acharya uh, he says that as you had mentioned that uh, by uh, bias which possibly ne possibly needs to be removed to take the right next step uh, he is asking how do you see this bias getting removed 
when responses to any questionnaire or survey can be subjective to timing when the data was collected, uh, state of the individual and other circumstances. This is uh, changing within quarters and their priorities are also shifting in. So uh, how do you uh, uh, collect, uh, get the authenticity of the data is what he's asking. Um, the authenticity of data is possible only through, through prior preparation. So little preparation is definitely required. One. Number two, we need to sensitize uh, someone through which we are collecting data. So when I'm, uh, I'm assuming that we are talking from performance appraisal uh, point of view or in general, whenever we collect data. So I'm just taking performance appraisal. It is important for us to sensitize managers specifically uh, who are going to rate their employees. Uh, HR or organization most of the time take ownership of performance management system or collection of data uh, for appraisal. If this ownership gets shifted to managers, the data authenticity would be more. So if manager themselves are responsible for um, uh, collecting data and uh, providing right data about employee, the authenticity would be more. Uh, for this organization, they have to prepare their managers on the importance of performance management system and the importance of data that they are collecting. So therefore, I said it is important for us to sensitize them in general, um, uh, because I know uh, Devadatta, I would just uh, say that like, he may be asking from a research point of view. Now, in research also, it is possible to collect data by sensitizing, providing more information to the um, to the person who is. Uh, collecting data uh, from where we are collecting data or the respondent. So if we will inform respondent about the purpose of the research or purpose of purpose of me collecting data, if we will sensitize them about the importance of it, it would be the chances are there that we would get F, uh, objective data. I can't say that we will eliminate bias, but we can definitely minimize bias through that. Okay, I hope the, the, the Taiwan question was answered. Uh, next question is from Srini. Uh, he says that the candidate uh, accepts employment offer then during the new notice period uh, to his previous employer, which is usually uh, 60 days, he gets another job offer and the renege, uh, the, they renege the offer in the last part of the 60 day notice. What is your advice on using predictive tools like behavior traits? and anything we can get from the public infos uh, if you get information uh, like from social media or anything yes so uh, usually what happens is we as i said we um, there is a method of post offer follow up and in this post offer follow up we end up uh, try, uh, we we have a method called understanding pattern of behavior and we try and gauge the different uh, pattern that is uh, that is possible and a particular specific pattern which may engage in renage more uh, so um, in in technical terms i uh, i'm using that term so there is a, there are predictive analytics tool for example logistics regression uh, it it helps us in predicting whether the candidate will renege or not renege. So I have two possible outcomes, zero and one, wherein a candidate would renege or may not renege. And then in the uh, as an outcome variable and as an input variable, I have data, as I said, like notice period, notice period extended or not extended, or um, uh, the um, date of joining extended or not extended, or uh, the candidate is male or female, or the candidate's location has been shifted or not, and all these uh, information that I have. And given these information, we can predict whether the candidate would renege or not renege. So I can, uh, so what Srini is actually asking is, at the last leg of the offer period, the candidate usually says that I won't join. 
or probably tomorrow we have to join and today uh, tomorrow the candidate has to join and today the candidate is saying, saying that i won't join it is a cost to the organization so what we usually do is we start seeing the pattern beforehand we know that prob probably this candidate will renege so we are ready with a waiting list candidate we start engaging with them also and as soon as the the candidate would say no we will engage the waiting list candidate and we won't waste much time but because these candidates are usually uh, hired because a client i have also responsibility for responsibility for client i i would be answerable to client if one person did not join uh, at a particular time so therefore it is important for me to create a waiting list candidate by before uh, so during the post offer follow up period itself we understand that probably this candidate will renege and we start engaging with the waiting list candidate and thus we reduce the cost and time of uh, you know in uh, filling the position right yes yeah so uh, rini uh, srini says it is good to know or predict when we make an offer yeah so uh, let's move on to the next question uh, the next question is from chaitanya uh, he says uh, hello sumi wonderful hearing you your address uh, on this fascinating issue uh, of analytics my concern for the projects that have shorter time cycles like deep sea wireline testing uh, in the, uh, we collect and curate the data project uh, seem to end uh, can we think of providing solution using people analytics so he, uh, uh, i think he means like for shorter short term projects uh, uh, how to collect and curate the data for the project uh, so that uh, how people analytics can be used for short term projects hiring people for short term projects yeah so uh, in in this case in this i would say that it is better to have right workforce analytics wherein we uh, try and plan uh, beforehand what is the duration of the project and how many people we would need for that particular project um, and um, of course uh, as he rightly said most of the time we uh, fall short of time when we uh, when we actually execute project and we we are not able to keep timeline of that um uh, as far as i understood the uh, question it says how to uh, make sure that people would be able to effectively complete task within the stipulated time of the project now to ensure this we have to uh, so actually uh, the answer to this question is uh, i i won't be able to actually answer it perfectly but uh, what i believe is uh, mapping talent would be the best possible option uh, so yeah. i have a project i know what all skill sets are required in this project and what kind of talent i have available in the organization given the skill set and then map those things map the talent required for the project and map the talent that i have in the organization when we map these two it would be uh, one one solution is this another solution uh, is is it that um, did we take stretch factor into account when we are trying to predict the dur time duration of completion of project so if i have taken stretch factor stretch factor is uh, which is beyond our control so sometimes you know a lot of external factors comes into picture because of which the uh, project may not go as expected so um, so if we will take into account that also beforehand and uh, try to see whether these skill sets and given these condition uh, time frame number of employees available are we will be be able to complete a project in a given uh, time or not so that is what i as uh, as of now will be able to answer uh, the question but i'll take this question and we'll see how um, how well i can frame it a little later yeah great 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 uh, chaitanya you can uh, connect with ma'am on linkedin or offline uh, 
for this. So I we have a very interesting question from Ankur over here. He says, how does GDPR or the upcoming PDPB, uh, the People uh, Data Protection Bill, affect people analytics, especially pra parameters like a civil score or sensitive person information like single mom with bedridden mother. So how do you think people analytics will be affected by uh, GDPR and PDBP? Um, so let me just go to data privacy part. It is important for, uh, for organization to collect data. And at the same time, it is very important for organization to understand the sensitivity of the data. And uh, when we collect people uh, analytics data, we emphasize on veracity and value parameter of, so there are five, six Vs of uh, analytics uh, right. when we collect data. And one of the important Vs that we have for uh, people analytics is veracity, which means quality of data and value, which means it is not only data for an organization. It is an information of people. So we have to be sensitive about that. And we have to understand the thin line between when, when I'm con converting an information into a data. So how, uh, so how organization should deal with is to understand and protect the privacy of the data. Data cannot be used or cannot be shared with anyone and everyone data has to be uh, used by some authorized individual um, but it doesn't mean that we need not collect that data collection of the data is important so collection of data about a mother having uh, about single mother having uh, you know bedridden parent is i think is right we should collect that data but how we are using it is more an important question. Is it that we are misutilizing it by taking decisions, unfavorable decisions uh, for that, or we are utilizing it by taking more informed decision about that? So here is the difference. Rather than saying not collect or collect, it is important to say maintain privacy of the data understand the difference between information and data and also look at how data gets utilized have more control on that this would what yeah. i would suggest right true absolutely agree with you on this uh, so big data and analytics on big data happens in this manner only. So I think people analytics won't be affected that much. Uh, we uh, are here on uh, a hard timeline. I'll just take one more question. Guys, if you have more questions, please do comment and we'll try to answer your questions in the comments later. I'll just take one question from Radhika. She says, uh, is it possible? I think it is for uh, Nivedita. Is it possible to assess the integrity of potential employee during the interview stage? to predict the likelihood of joining the organization? Uh, well, during the interview stage, uh, again, there can be multiple yeah. stages of interview for that matter. So maybe, uh, yes, uh, I think integrity is one parameter which definitely can help in uh, not only predicting the likelihood of, uh, you know, any, uh, of a candidate joining or not joining in, uh, but also if there are any chances as to how if, you know, if there's any uh, chances that he would engage into any kind of, uh, you know, unethical work practices uh, or, uh, you know, uh, counterproductive work behaviors as well. So this kind of information uh, during, or rather, I would stay as, uh, as I would rather say a stage before just the final interview round can definitely be very helpful. Great. I hope uh, we have answered almost all questions. I think. Uh, uh, you might be there we uh, it's almost uh, about one hour uh, we will end the session over here thank you uh, sumi ma'am for your wonderful insights our audience uh, really had a great time uh, thank you nivedita for joining uh, thank you nivedita for sharing your insights as well uh, we follow nine links for more uh, linkedin lives that we are doing as a series and have a good day all you guys thank you thank, thank you, you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a bye -bye. nice time.